Well, I'm uh, currently preaching a series of messages <clears throat> through the book of Acts. And if you recall, uh, last week we examined the opening portion. We had to be short because of Lord's Supper. But we examined the opening portion of the Apostle Peter's famous sermon there on the day of Pentecost. Uh, of course, it was not only Peter's first sermon, but the very first sermon ever preached in the church era. We're moving forward in that sermon today. Acts 2, beginning in verse 22. Acts 2 and 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. There are seven or eight sermons in that one passage. I'm going to make one out of it today. But I remind you, it's remarkable that Peter is the one standing here in front of a Jewish crowd, publicly preaching and witnessing for Jesus Christ, considering the fact, once again, his multiple profane denials that he even knew Jesus at the time of the Master's arrest. Peter had changed and he had changed radically because he and the others had seen Christ in the flesh, risen from the dead. Praise be unto God. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man, accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. What is this a statement of? The miracles... The signs that Christ did in their midst during his incarnation. This is one of three points that Peter makes to affirm the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. The other two appear later in our passage. And they are Christ's bodily resurrection and his physical ascension to the Father's right hand. And frankly, just one of these proofs would have been sufficient to show Christ's identity. As no human being who has ever lived could do any of these things by his own power, yet Peter shared not one, not two, but three incredible, irrefutable points about our Lord. <clears throat> and you might quickly read over that initial phrase, men of Israel, but that phrase is significant because it is clear these Jews were eyewitnesses to Christ's miracles. And this seems clear because Peter ends the verse with this phrase, as you yourselves know. How could they know such things? Because they were there. They saw it with their own eyes. And notice Peter says these miracles were done among you. In other words, they were done out in the plain view, 
in the eye of many witnesses, not in secret. So often the charlatans today, the people out there selling snake oil on the cable networks, they claim to do all these miraculous things, but they're done behind closed doors. You'll hear stories, I won't name names, I could and probably ought to, but I'll refrain. I, I, I feel more reserved today, so I'll be kind. I make no promises later on, but for right now I'll be restrained in this. <clears throat> I knew of a man who claimed to have raised the dead. And he claimed to have done it, of course, in a far-flung country. No cameras, no people around, only a, a, a private audience, you see. <clears throat> you can't confirm something like that, can you? You can't know what happened. In Christ's day, he did these things in the public square. They were there for all to see. The CNN of his day was there. And they all saw it. He says, you yourselves know it in your heart. Done among you. In verse 22, Peter's point is this. It was abundantly clear that Jesus was the Messiah because of the many miracles he performed. And folks, there has never been anyone like our Lord Jesus Christ. No one else by his own power can walk on the water. I want to pause there for a moment. We use that phrase today flippantly. When someone's a great athlete, when someone's a, a, a superstar in the business world, or someone's a comer, 40 under 40, they make the list or whatever, we say, oh, he walks on water. And they use that in any symbolic terms. Jesus Christ literally walked on water. If you have a swimming pool, go out there. It'll be a cool, crisp autumn afternoon. Go in your backyard today and try it out. See how it works for you. You say, well, I paid a preacher, I put on a few pounds. I don't care if you weigh 50 pounds. Put a squirrel out there and see what happens. As a full-grown man, Jesus Christ walked on water. There was no sandbar. There were no special effects. That was water just as it exists today, and the Master rose above it. Why? He's God. Very simply. Who else can walk on the water but Christ? No one can. Who else can heal the blind, open the ears of the deaf? Who else can raise the dead? If you are a skeptic, we're online today, people will see this many years in the future. If you're someone who holds to an alternative view of spirituality, you must come up with some alternative explanation for all of these miracles. And that is a fool's errand. It's been rightly said, Norm Geisler and others, a Christian apologist, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Folks, it takes more faith to come up with these alternative explanations than it does just to recognize Christ is who he claimed to be. It's very simple. You cannot explain away historical facts. Jesus Christ did things that were physically impossible in front of large crowds and not just once, but repeatedly over and over again. Jesus Christ was a miracle worker. And Peter tells the crowd. Verse 23, This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. The execution, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are the most significant events in the history of the world. If you know Christ, you know that is a true statement. You say, it's not the end of World War II. It's not the signing of some peace accord. Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, the most significant event that will ever occur. Above and beyond anything or anyone else. So let's look at the issues in verse 23. Some have said... Perhaps the death of Christ was an accident. Maybe he was at the wrong place at the wrong time in history. Maybe he just had a run of really bad luck. And as we examine these questions, another related question arises. <clears throat> and again, this is a, a whole series. Who really killed Jesus? Who's the responsible party? These are not simple questions. Well, first of all, 
regarding the death of Christ, who's involved? The Romans actually executed Jesus. The Roman government had the authority to carry it out. They were the ones who physically killed Christ. They literally drove the nails into the precious hands of the Son of God. So obviously they're guilty. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Satan played a role in this. We know that. But I'm not going to give him any airtime today. But clearly the devil's involved in all these things. <clears throat> what about the Jews? The Jews were clearly complicit in Christ's death. But I want to pause there for a moment. There have been people over the years who have called the Jews Christ killers and things like that. There are people who have come up with excuses for anti-Semitic behavior because the Jews killed Jesus. That is a statement of stunning ignorance. And you'll see why in a moment. Were the Jews involved? Yes, they were. But did the Jews quote-unquote murder Jesus? They did not. But did they play a role? Well... Both the religious leaders and the masses of Jewish people did. Regarding the Jewish religious leaders, Matthew 26, 3-4 says this, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed, scheme being a, a negative term, a, a, covertly, to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. These religious leaders were almost like mob bosses. They were mafia people today. Organized crime almost. They were so dark in what they did. But what about the masses of the people? The religious leaders were corrupt. We know that. But what about the common folk? The common Jewish citizens? They have guilt also. Remember, when Pilate was standing there, Barabbas and Christ, both before them, do you remember how they responded in Matthew 27? Pilate said, what should he do with Jesus? They wanted Barabbas released. They cried out, crucify him. The masses of people. And it is certainly possible, I think even likely, that some who were there in Peter's audience that day on Pentecost were the very same ones crying out at the top of their lungs, crucify him before Pontius Pilate. How would Peter's words have made them feel? Can we even begin to imagine the sense of dread and regret that likely crept into their hearts, maybe not initially, but as the depth of Peter's sermon began to sink in? As they began to experience conviction, can you imagine how you would have felt? You cry out, crucify him, and you realize you've killed the Son of God. So the Romans, the Jewish leaders, the common Jewish people, the devil himself, all played a role <clears throat> in Christ's death. But even that doesn't cover all the parties involved. Two more I want to touch on here. God himself. God planned from the beginning for Jesus to die for the sins of the world. Why? Because that was the only way for sinners to be reconciled to the Lord. And as some have said, and we get philosophical here, we go down a real rabbit hole here. Well, if God knew in advance that men were going to sin, and therefore Christ was going to have to give his life for the sins of mankind, why did God create the world in the first place? What was the point? You say, wait, preacher, I haven't had enough coffee for that. Why even move forward? When he knew the price, he would personally have to pay as a result of creation. Why did the Lord create man? Why do you exist? Why do I exist? Why does anything exist at all? Why did God move forward? <clears throat> One of the best explanations I've ever heard comes from the preacher's outline and study Bible. It gets to the heart of it. Please listen carefully. Why did God do it? God wanted a creature, a being with free will. God created man because God willed to have the presence of a being who could freely choose to love and worship him, to obey and fellowship with him, to serve and reign with him. In his foreknowledge, God knew that some would choose him and some would reject him, but he was willing to face the pain and the hurt to his heart 
the abuse and the shame to his person, the rejection and the rebellion against his will, God was willing to face all this in order that some might know his glorious mercy and grace and experience all the glory of himself and heaven. God was willing to face it all for you and for me. He knew full well what you were going to do and he created you anyway. Knowing the price. And people have the nerve to say, I don't think God loves me. I don't have the time to address it. Who have you died for? And you question God. Well, with that understood, does that somehow mean that God was ultimately responsible for Christ's death? Some theologians will say, yes, I disagree. Was it God's fault? Well, first of all, that, that term never should be applied to God. That's misplaced. It was not God's fault after all. There would have been no need for the ultimate sacrifice were it not for our sin. And Romans 3 and 23 tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So while the Romans, the Jews, the devil all play key roles in causing Christ's death, and the Lord himself preordained that it would occur, it was ultimately the sins of all human beings, including mine, including yours, that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. In that movie, The Passion of the Christ, and of course it's a Catholic film, but that being said, Mel Gibson, as I understand it, in the part of the film where they're actually nailing Christ's hands to the cross, Mel Gibson stepped in. He did that himself on, on camera. Those are his hands. To remind himself of the role he played in nailing Christ to the cross. I could have been the fill-in. You could have also. If we want to know who is responsible for the death of Jesus Christ, we should all take a sobering look in the mirror. I'm responsible, and you are. Verse 24 continues, But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. We know from this verse, and of course many others, God raised Jesus from the dead. But when we look at the totality of the New Testament, we see that it wasn't just the Father who raised Christ. All three members of the Trinity were involved in this, the greatest of all events. For example, Romans 8 and 11. <clears throat> and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. <clears throat> what about Christ himself? We sometimes wonder, Jesus Christ endured the kenosis, that is the emptying out, of some of his attributes, he veiled a portion of himself to accomplish his earthly mission. How powerful was Jesus Christ when he walked the earth in human garment, in human form? How powerful was he really? As he walked the earth, he cast a shadow, he moved the dirt, he left footprints. At a given moment in time, Jesus the man, how powerful was he? Well, he speaks to that. John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recall what he had said. They believed, then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. John 10, 17 through 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Hold, hold right there. Was Jesus Christ murdered? No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus Christ was not taken by surprise. God was not in any way going to plan B. Jesus Christ died voluntarily for my sins and yours. It was the eternal plan of God. And hear the power of Christ here in John 10 and 17 and 18. 
I, Jesus Christ, first person, I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. How much power at any given time did Jesus Christ have? All the power that there is. Omnipotence. Yes, he took on an additional nature, but folks, his divine nature was always there. Can you imagine the restraint that it took to stay on a cross being mocked by people whose your blood is being shed for? And I recognize, yes, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have called all the angels. But strictly speaking, he needed no assistance. To stay on that cross when all the power in the world is within you. Hearing the jeers, the mockery of the crowd. Can you imagine the restraint that it took? The patience that it took? I have authority. The ultimate authority. What is the agony of death referred to here? Well, that phrase literally means birth pangs. And this is something of a difficult phrase to interpret, but the general idea is quite clear. The grave could not hold Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God incarnate. How could he stay in the grave? The very author of life? Christ says, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. There was no chance Christ was staying in the tomb. Death could not hold him. David said about him in verse 25, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Now, Peter here quotes David's writing in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And this is extremely important because by referencing David in the Psalms, Peter was saying the Old Testament prophecy was not written about some unknown Messiah that would be appearing tens of thousands of years in the future. Peter is directly claiming that David was writing specifically about Jesus of Nazareth and his true identity as God's Messiah. Christ is is at the Father's right hand, the place of ultimate honor and exaltation. And David is writing about these events 1,000 years before they took place. And despite the fact that he's writing 10 centuries earlier, Peter has no qualms, no hesitation in directly declaring, David was writing about our Lord Jesus Christ. How amazing that is. The implications are Staggering. Can you tell me what's going to happen tomorrow with certainty? How accurate is a weather forecast using all the scientific tools? Good luck. Can you tell me what's going to happen 10 years from now? Will you, will you be alive 10 years from now? The one that says he will probably won't be. 1,000 years... And it's perfectly accurate. And remember, this was not an academic discussion for Peter. What he said about Jesus Christ publicly had real life ramifications for him. He was taking a real risk. Of course, the Bible is silent on Peter's death, but some historical sources suggest he was crucified upside down as a martyr for Christ. And of course, hist historically, what, by tradition, what do we know? He said, I'm not worthy to die the way the Master died. So crucify me upside down. Quite a transformation, wouldn't you say? But with all that risk, knowing full well what he was facing, here he is, telling the Jews one of their most beloved patriarchs was writing about the Christian Messiah one thousand years earlier and amazingly David is writing in the first person as if he's aware he's writing details about the Messiah under supernatural inspiration David writes in the first person why the Holy Spirit's all over him. therefore my heart is glad 
and my tongue rejoices, my body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. Psalm 16, the quotation continues here. There's a dual application, both to the life of David and to Jesus. The realm of the dead referred to here as Hades. That's the equivalent of the Old Testament term Sheol. And David was glad in the Lord. He did praise Him, just as Christ praised the Father. But it seems clear this entire passage could not apply only to David. David couldn't fulfill all of it. Chuck Swindoll observes, It's a song written by David about his own death and his hope of resurrection through your Holy One who would not decay in a grave. In other words, David pinned his hope of resurrection on the resurrection of the Messiah. David could not have been talking about himself as your Holy One because he died and was buried. And as Peter says in verse 29 of our text, I'll go ahead and cover that now, the location of David's tomb was well known. What did he say? Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. In other words, David's body was still in his tomb, and logically it had experienced the natural decaying process. So David wasn't referring to his own flesh. He had to be prophesying about someone else. And that person was none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. God revealed the resurrection to David across the centuries supernaturally. Folks, the ink on these scrolls had been dry for a thousand years. You could not change the content. They could not be revised on a computer screen. And what did they say? That the one spoken of by David would not face physical decay of his body. And in all the annals of human history, whose body meets that criteria? Jesus Christ alone. Going back to verse 28 for a moment. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Again, dual application both David and Jesus. Did David anticipate the joy he'd experience in heaven? Of course he did. But Jesus, at a much higher, an infinitely higher level, recognized expectantly what it was going to be like to be reunited with the Father. To be where the Lord is is to be filled with joy. As Christ's followers, that's what we have to look forward to in the world to come. How great it truly is to be a child of God. In verses 30 and 31, But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Now, in the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets. We know that. And here Peter identifies David directly as a prophet of the Lord. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and in other places, God makes a great covenant, the Davidic covenant with David, that his offspring will forever rule upon the throne. And of course, through Mary's lineage, Jesus was born in the Davidic line, and Jesus will serve forever as the ultimate Davidic king. Again, God was not surprised by the death of Christ. It was his plan from the very beginning for Christ to die, an atoning death for the sins of the world. And the Lord had arranged all of these details thousands of years in advance, including the determination of the exact bloodline that Christ would come from. Do you see the details? All of it coming together. Verse 32, God has, has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Take, take careful note here of the fact that Peter speaks of the Messiah generally in verse 31. And in the very next verse, verse 32, he directly and specifically identifies the Messiah as Jesus of Nazareth. He could not have made it any plainer, any more direct. And from a Jewish perspective, that really is remarkable. The resurrection reiterated yet again. Peter states, all of the disciples are eyewitnesses of Christ's bodily resurrection. Peter calls it a fact. 
And he should know he was there. Exalted to the right hand of God, verse 33, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see in here. Here we go to the third line of evidence, the ascension of Christ. Where did Christ go after he ascended? To the right hand of God. And notice again the heavy emphasis on the Trinity. Jesus the Son was exalted and elevated once again to God the Father's right hand. And now the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, has been poured out upon men. Beware the religious group, the belief system, the denomination that denies the Trinity. It's all over the Bible. You cannot miss it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is a triune God. One God revealed in three persons. Verses 34 to 35. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. <clears throat> so yet more proof that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, more emphasis on the ascension. This is a quotation of Psalm 110 and verse 1, a psalm of David. And again, a thousand years earlier, in the gospel accounts, <clears throat> these are written a thousand years earlier, and Christ says earlier in the gospels, these were written about himself. Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 37. What does Christ say? While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under, feet, under your feet. Hear this. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? And the large crowd listened to him with delight. What was Christ really saying here in Mark chapter 12? He was quoting Psalm 110 to prove his deity. Charles Ryrie explains, Christ was trying to make the Pharisees see that the son of David was also the Lord of David. The Messiah was both David's human descendant and his divine Lord. David was not writing about himself. That much is clear. As I said earlier... David's remains were still in his grave. They knew where it was located. That grave was still occupied. He was not seated at the Father's right hand. So David was referring to a third party. And remarkably, ten centuries in advance, the details of the coming Messiah's ascension are declared. Christ is the only figure in human history to ascend to the Father in this way. And he did so in front of eyewitnesses who believed it was so authentic they were willing to die for it. So what do we make of verse 35? Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It's a statement of power. It's a statement of victory for Jesus Christ. God the Father is saying all who oppose Jesus will eventually be put down. It hasn't happened yet. Look at this profane, Christ-denying world we live in in 2020. All the naysayers, all the skeptics, all those who profane the name of the Son of God, it won't always be as it is now. This is for but a season. It's just a matter of time. Verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is the summary statement. And Peter is essentially saying this to everyone. All men of Israel, every person listening to my voice, I have presented evidence and facts concerning the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. And the conclusion is inescapable. He's exactly who he claimed to be and his blood is on your hands. And they of all people should have recognized that reality. God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. The title Lord here in the New Testament context speaks both to the deity of Christ and his absolute authority. 
the title Christ uh, is a, a form of Greek, and it's essentially the same word as the Hebrew title Messiah. It literally means anointed one. And to show you just how significant it is, Peter used both titles to a Jewish crowd that believed only in God the Father. Listen carefully to the words of the Luke Acts scholar. He's probably the most knowledgeable man in academia on the book of Luke and Acts. Daryl Bach at Dallas Seminary said this, The title of Lord was a more important title than Messiah, for it pictured Jesus' total authority. And hear this, His ability and His right to serve as an equal with God the Father. And then Peter confronts the crowd with their unspeakable error once again. What did God's chosen people do with God's Messiah? With the Lord He sent to them, they killed Him. And they did so in the worst way possible, in a manner reserved for the lowest of criminals and slaves. They crucified God in the flesh. What was the response of the crowd? Lord willing, I'll present that next week, but for now. Recognize, Peter confronted this crowd to show them two primary points. Number one, the true identity of Jesus Christ. Number two, the fact that they had sinned against the spotless Son of God, the Savior of the world. And when those two concepts are fully grasped, the reasonable person recognizes he must make a decision about Jesus Christ the Lord. I certainly pray you've made the right decision concerning him. Some say, I'll decide later. To not choose Christ is to have chosen not to follow him. As I close this morning, I want to remind you that when Peter repeats David's admonition, his admonition that God the Father will one day make the enemies of Christ into a footstool for his feet, and I told you that was a statement of victory and power, that is still true for people living today. Chuck Swindoll once said, this idea of a footstool is an image of involuntary servitude. Put another way, in 2020, you can choose to trust Jesus Christ now as your Lord and your Savior and thereby experience life in its fullness as it was meant to be lived. Or you can foolishly go your own way and live life in a way that does not include Jesus, but it seems right to you. And the Bible directly speaks to those who would go their own way. Proverbs 14 and 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. For those here in the auditorium listening to me today, for those who may watch this online or at some point in the future, please hear me clearly. Jesus Christ is indeed the Lord of all things. And you will recognize that while you have breath in your body, in the here and now, voluntarily, and experience the love of Christ, or you will bow down involuntarily in judgment on the other side. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is your choice? Let's pray together. Father, I praise your matchless name. I praise you for the plan that you had before the world began to die for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. How can we help but praise you? How can we help but live our lives totally surrendered unto you? Thank you for your plan, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. We owe you everything. Praise be unto your name. Lord, have your way in this invitation. May your purpose be accomplished.
I praise you both now and forever. In the most high name, that of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I simply say to you today, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, mark it down, that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can meet Jesus as your friend now, as your all in all. Or you can meet him later as your judge. That's the way of the fool, the second one. Call upon him. He's here today. Wherever you may be, he's everywhere. Call upon him. From the bottom of your heart, just speak to him. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm afraid. This message of Peter that's been reiterated, it frightens me. I'm convicted, Lord. And I recognize I need Jesus Christ. Right now, I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, my Lord, my King. I believe in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please save me. Forgive my sin. Take me to heaven when I die. I'm all in. Change me, Lord. I trust you as my Savior. On the authority of the Word of God, come to Christ sincerely. It's not the words. I hear this so often. People stumble over it. It's the attitude of your heart. You come to Jesus Christ sincerely. He will receive you. And praise God for it. Come to Him. Cry out from your heart. I need you, Lord Jesus. And He'll embrace you with His nail-scarred hands. Call upon Him. Today is the day of salvation. Maybe you've been saved but not baptized. Baptism is the first step of obedience for the saved person. Those waters don't save you, but they're symbolic of the fact you have already been saved and you're following Christ. Have you been baptized since you were saved? If not, come forward. Make us aware of that. Maybe God's calling you to join this church. We'd love to have you. Come forward. Make us aware of that. Maybe there's some other issue in your life. I'll help you as best I can. But whatever God is calling you to, whatever decision He's calling you to, I remind you of this biblically. There's always an imperative to take action while God is dealing with you. The Bible never supports putting it off, kicking the can down the road. Today is the day of salvation.